All right. Um, welcome everyone again. I'm very happy you guys are here on this Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I'm glad everyone could make it. Um, we're here to talk about Native American Heritage Day. And we will we have a wonderful speaker here from the museum in Novato. Her name is Victoria Kenbe, and she is here with us today. And she's going to talk about Native American representation and identity. Victoria, are you here? I am here. Hi. Hi. Thanks for making it. I'm very happy you could make it. Yeah. Victoria, the, um, executive um, director. And she's here to talk today about to us. And um, I think it would be awesome. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Victoria Camby. I also go by Tori. Uh, and I am the executive director at the Museum of the American Indian in Nevada. It's located in Miwok Park. It's like northern Nevada, if you haven't been there. And um, I've been the director for about two years. And um, it's been interesting because I started right during COVID. So <laughs> it's not the experience that I thought it would be, but I've been um, really having a great time. Um, my goals are really to bring native visibility to Marin County. Um, my background is in mostly arts, uh, specifically traditional ecological knowledge or um, contemporary American Indian art. Um, I studied at Sonoma State uh, with a, his, a bachelor's in history, art history, and then I got my master's at Dominican University. And I have a, um, I'm currently working on another degree in museum studies through the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, which is um, teaching decolonized methodologies. So it's really amazing to learn about museums and the impacts that they've had on Native people. So. Awesome, thank you for being here. That sounds all super interesting. Um, I know the museum up there is super fun and super cool. So people should definitely go check it out. You said you're in Mivok Park, right? So yeah, I think that could be fun. Um, do you wanna start with your presentation? Sure, I'll do that. Let, let me make you co-host so you can share your presentation if you want. Okay. There we go. So I brought pictures because I think that everybody loves to have pictures to look at because <laughs> um, uh, it kind of makes it a little more dynamic when you're looking at it, when you're listening to somebody speak. So I'm offering a, a native perspective on native identity because I am native and um, you know, for indigenous people, we've often had other people representing us um, rather than ourselves. And so it's more in the last, I think, since uh, maybe the seventies, even as the mid sixties that native people were able actually to step forward and speak up for themselves, um, especially with the American Indian movement, which is very located in this Bay area. Uh, the history is very rooted here and in other major cities throughout the US. Um, so I want to start out with um, a land acknowledgement, um, you know, and a land acknowledgements are done, you know, really to kind of ground ourselves where we are. Um, I don't know if everybody's in Marin County, but I am. So I'll just read my land acknowledgement. Um, Marin is on the ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people, including Coast Miwok Tribal Council of Marin and the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. And we recognize that those who are federally recognized and those who are not. It is important to acknowledge the neighboring tribes to Marin and specifically because tribes were not stationary in the Bay Area, they moved around. I mean, if you look at, you can see land everywhere and you could get there by canoe. So it's pretty easy to travel around. So to the east, and the south, we have the Ramatush, the Muwekma, the Chochenyo, and the band and different bands of Ohlone. And to the north, we have the Southern Pomo. And then I, you know, I've been learning about land acknowledgements, and they constantly need to change. They can, they should not stay static. And one of the things I recently learned from somebody I'm collaborating with at Dominican University is um, acknowledging that Zoom is a media platform that we're using today, and it's headquarters in San Jose, California. And that is on the traditional lands of the Ohlone, Tamian, and Muwekma peoples. And so, um, you know, I would definitely encourage that if you are maybe not a regular meeting every single time, but if you're in a meeting in a group, it's great to bring a land acknowledgement. 
and to open it up to people to acknowledge what land and territory they're on. Um, and I included a photo here of, of my, one of my favorite plants, and this plant is local to this area. It's called mugwort or Artemisia diglisana, which is a Latin name. It's a, very, it's a traditional plant used by the local peoples. Uh, it can be used as a, as a smudge or a purification, um, and it also is really helpful for keeping like bugs off of things. So um, feathers, for instance, if you smudge with this, the bugs will be less likely to invest, infest. Um, it's also very good for female reproduction uh, organs, and it's also uh, very good for dreams. So you can put it under your pillow. It's very strong medicine, so I wouldn't suggest taking a lot of it if you drink it, um, but it can bring intense dreams too. So it's, it's known for that. Um, and it can be found in the creeks around this area. It's a, it's a magic plant. So that's uh, also part of my land acknowledgement. So just to share with you, um, here is, um, this is my ancestral background in a fantastic drawing I, um, that I always look back to, to understand the cosmology of my people. Um, I come from the Diné and I say Diné cosmology, not Navajo, because one of the things that um, is commonly happens for tribes is that you have tribes had an identity. So we called ourselves Diné, but when colonizers came to this area, they started calling us something else and they started calling us Navajo. So if you look at most tribal maps, you're gonna see Navajo as the name on there. But one of the things that we're trying to do is decolonize and reclaim our identity. And that means using our proper name for ourselves, which is Dene. And so if you see this, you'll see the black, the blue, the yellow, and then the white, which is, these are the different worlds that we claim came through. And it's within the four sacred mountains that we came out of the earth. Oh. And so in the very center, you can see that there's a little round shape and that's called the Hogan. And that's the kind of dwellings and homes that we live in. We don't live in teepees, we live in Hogans. And the Hogan is actually in our constellation, the North Star. And so everything revolves around it. And it, what, what is really important to understand is that for my tribe, the four sacred mountains is where everything happened. So forest relocation is something that a lot of native people faced. And um, one of the really traumatizing things is, is that, for instance, with my people, when I use my people as an example, but you can relate this with many native tribes, when you relocate them, which we were attempted to be relocated through the long walk, you're taking them from their source of way of life, the food that they eat, the cosmology, the way that they believe and relate with everything around them. So when you move them, it's like an attempt at completely destroying the culture. <clears throat> and, and it's actually a tactic of genocide. If you look up in the UN, there's five different definitions of genocide and one of them is moving people out of their area. Um, and so we were actually able to negotiate in 1868 to stay in our sacred mountains. And I think that that's one of the reasons my tribe has been so successful and is one of the largest tribes in the United States. And that's where my mother's from, Shiprock, New Mexico. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it's in the Four Corners area. I don't know if you guys can see, can you see my little arrow? Okay, so it's Shiprock's like right here, in Colorado, Utah, uh, Arizona, New Mexico. And the green area is the reservation that my family's from. And you can see these are the four mountains. Right. And so we were we were marched off, force marched, and then we were able to return to our land. Um, and so one of the most common things that I get asked at the museum um, is what what terminology should we use when we're talking about American Indian people um, or Native American? And you know, usually it's which one of these terms is the best term, right? That's probably the most common question I get asked. Um, and I tend to tell people neither one of those terms are good. <laughs> I just say neither of them really, really are an appropriate term. They both are problematic, um, partially because, you know, native to America, I think a lot of people feel native to America because they were born here. Um, America is a colonized term, a colonizer term, 
And American Indian, the Indian is, um, you know, the one of the origin stories of that is that Columbus was lost, right? So neither one of those terminologies actually really has worked, I think, effectively to represent um, all the diversity of the tribes. So it's um, one of the things I always tell people is that, it, you know, the UN did meet and indigenous peoples nations from all over the Americas met and they all agreed that indigenous peoples, capital I, capital P and, cap and an S on the end is the best way to refer to the nations, the indigenous nations of the Americas. So that's usually what I tell people and that's what we teach the kids at the museum when they come for tours. And um, I put this map up because we're talking about all of these different tribes, right? And so this is an example of, you know, when I was saying earlier, Diné versus Navajo. Um, when you look at, if you could see, and I would highly recommend going to this website, it's Erin Kara. Let's see, I gotta move Aaron Carapella's maps, right? These are really amazing maps because what this person is doing is actually going to the maps and they're taking off all the boundaries, right? And they're putting in the accurate tribal names. So all the names. So if you found down below in the Southwest in the Four Corners area, you would actually see Dene rather than Navajo. And it's shocking, like I look at this map and I have to learn every single time when I'm looking at it, new names of new tribal communities. That I just didn't even know their original names, their real names. And you can see that it's a densely, you know, it gets to the point where it's almost impossible to distinguish the names, especially in California. And that's because there are so many tribes and there's even more, they're constantly updating this map. Um, one of the things I think it's interesting about this particular map is that these colored lines that are running through are the pipelines. So it's just kind of interesting to know that because I don't know if anybody's followed, but the, you know, there's the pipeline three and then there was Standing Rock and these are cutting right through indigenous tribal areas. Um, and so one of the things I think too, when we talk about like identifying grouping indigenous people, it's kind of problematic because really tribes are so different. If you were gonna look at my tribe versus the Coast Miwok who are in Marin County, they're gonna be so completely different. It's gonna be just as different as, you know, you go into Europe and you think, you can't just think everybody's European because there's all different countries, right? So they all speak different languages, eat different foods, have different customs. It's just like that for native people throughout. So the tribes, even in California, we, there's a hundred and, nine federally recognized tribes and over 75 non-federally recognized tribes. And they're all different. They all speak different languages and they do different customs and different practices. And actually California is the most um, diverse in terms of uh, tribal nations in the United States. Um, another interesting thing is, is if you look at this map with no borders, no lines, a lot of times there's a lot of stigma and ideas that because you've got a border or a line drawn on a state or, or, or a division between a countries that these actually reflect can or define native nations. And that's totally inaccurate. There are tribes have been traveling and moving throughout the Americas since time immemorial. And they um, it's, you know, the tribes that are in Mexico They've been crossing back and forth through that area forever. And they've been going back and forth through New Mexico, Texas and Arizona and all those areas forever. So it's really kind of, you know, we see internal racism even among native tribes, but also within our own government about identity as indigenous peoples. And uh, we should be recognizing that there are indigenous nations throughout Central America, South America, Canada, and Alaska outside of the United States as well. Um, and one of the things I like to do when I talk to people and share is I like to give tools. So that map was a great tool. This is another great tool, nativeland.ca. Um, you can go to this website and you can enter in whatever location you're at and they will uh, 
point you into the direction of where, what territory you're on. So it's really interesting because for instance, this is what, when you look into the Bay Area, this is what you're gonna see. You can see the Coast Miwoker there. You can see that Great and Rancheria, which is the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo community. Um, you can see Muekma, you can see all these different kinds of, uh, you can all see all the different types of tribes in this area. And then the other thing that I like about this is that it doesn't have lines drawn. So many maps like to define and close in communities and nations. And that is just, there is so much that's problematic with that. Um, so this is a great tool to have. They also help um, with land acknowledgements as well. And, and actually I was talking with, um, Dean Hoagland, who's the chair of the Coast Miwok Tribal Council, and, and they were talking about going to Chicago and they wanted to do a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that they were in a territory outside of their own tribal nation, right? And so he was able to like look up where he was and figure out where he was so that he could acknowledge. And he was surprised because he had thought one thing and then found out another. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so some of the things that I think that's important to um, understand is uh, that, you know, Native nations have been affected um, by colonization at a, at, a, at, a, at a disturbing level. And if you look at this upper left-hand corner, like map of um, the United States, and it's all red, right? That's where Native people occupied. Um, and one of the things that comes up is, you know, we always look at numbers when we talk about Native people. We, you know, when I started studying about California Indian history, there was always this number of somewhere between 175 to 350,000. And what I think is problematic about that is that you, those numbers can become an issue when it comes to really understanding the impact of colonization you are creating a box and a limitation. And um, I have heard estimates that go up to a million people in California. And we think about how big California is, it's, it is probable that there could have been an, a million native people living here, but there really is no way to really track that. So when I tell people to, that, you know, to learn about indigenous cultures and to, to, to study and to share information, I, I often discourage people getting too attached to numbers. I also discourage people to get to, attached to dates and time frames of how many X amount of years that people were in certain areas. Because for one thing, I know that um, in my tribe, you know, when I go, when I think back to, you know, those four sacred mountains, I'll go back to them, right? These four sacred mountains, my people believe that we came right out of the earth right there. They do not believe in a land bridge story, right? There's a lot of stories of migration. Oh, they, you know, they came over the land bridge and they migrated south, right? They came into this area. Well, the problem with that is that it limits the creation story of the native people. If a person, if you get, went to a Hogan on the Navajo reservation and you met an elder medicine person, that medicine person believes that they came right from that earth and all of their ancestors since time immemorial came right out of the ground right there. So, and that exists as well for the Coast Miwok community that lives here. They believe that they came from this place. So a lot of times there's stories of, oh, we've been here for, you know, 10,000 years, 15,000 years, 26,000 years. But those kind of stories actually can be detrimental for Native people because they believe that they've come from the earth that they're on. And that's also why it can be really hard when you look at these maps because the forced relocation, and if you look, you can see from one side of the country, from the east to the west, they the movement and the loss of land that happened. And a lot of um, American Indian people be believe that in California, it was probably the worst out of all the places that were called, you know, all the, the damage that was done across the, the country, California suffered the most, the California native people. Because by the time they got to California, it was just kill the Indian, <laughs> you know, get rid of them, move them aside. 
Um, and, it, and the laws actually reflected that. What could we do to take their land away, to take away their rights of life, uh, to end their traditions, and to um, basically, uh, uh, you know, do whatever we can to exterminate them um, so that we can take the land and use the resources. So uh, these little red spots on this map right here are um, the reservations. And those are the uh, territories that native people actually reside on now. And this has reduced the culture to so little, right? And these, these are little strongholds. Um, and so I have, because I'm such a, a fanatic for uh, uh, Native art, especially contemporary Native art, I think it's really powerful. A lot of the Native artists that are making incredible art right now. Um, this painting is a painting I own. It's by an, a Diné artist named Craig George. And it moved me when I saw it because um, if you, it's called Going Home. And the idea is, is you know the struggle and the pain that so many native people have gone through. Um, you can see that there's an empty bottle of alcohol. He's outside a liquor store, right? He, and he's holding so closely to his pony, right? And I think he just wants to go back to the traditional ways. And that, that's what native people all over the Americas are struggling with. They want to go back to their original ways and they're working really hard to do that. But there is a cost to assimilation, you know, forced assimilation, forced relocation, boarding schools. My mom went to boarding school. Um, and that, you know, because of that, she was raised Methodist. She had no language. She had no traditions. Um, and uh, she was, she had lost all of, you know, basically her, her Diné ways. And family separation. I mean, we were not even citizens in this country until 1924. So, you know, all those, you know, really hard things that Native people face, it's really, it's, it's a lot to hold. And there is probably the highest statistics of suicide, school dropout, abuse um, in the country of any other, uh, of any other race. I think it's the highest in, in Native nations. I mean, we've also, just with COVID, because of poverty and things like that, we had some of the most um, highest rates per capita in, in the U.S., especially in my tribe, um, which is one of the reasons why we're also the highest vaccinated rate in community, which is our response. We mobilized. So, you know, this is, even though this is a truth, all this hardship that you know Native people hold, there is an important balance to understand that right now Native people are really thriving and doing incredible things, incredible work, like making incredible art, fashion, you know, uh, writing incredible books. And so, to kind of just you know move towards closing, um, I'd like to just go through these photos real. <laughs> and share who, who some of who these people are. And actually, it might be a good time to just take a couple notes if you, if you find any of these interesting because some of these communities are from actually the Bay Area. And there are things you can actually investigate about native culture in this area. Um, so starting over here, I'm gonna start here. I'm sure some people recognize who this is. Deb Holland, uh, Secretary of Interior. Um, Deb Holland is now a very powerful woman in the United States, and it's extremely huge for uh, Natives to be in charge of this department. It means a lot. Um, and I know it was huge when, we, when this happened. Um, she's an incredible leader. This is my Shiro. Uh, this is Winona LaDuke. She is um, from the White Earth uh, Reservation up in Minnesota. She runs an organization called Honor the Earth. If anybody is looking for an incredible uh, place to support or go shopping for Christmas, they sell actually traditionally harvest rice from their community. So the rice is actually wild rice growing and they harvest it in a traditional way. She's also pioneering hemp farming on native uh, land which is hopefully a business that native people get into because oftentimes plants like that we've used traditionally for, you know, since time immemorial, like tobacco get demonized or stigmatized. Hemp is one of them. 
And so, you know, destigmatizing plants like hemp is really powerful. And, you know, it's an incredible resource for paper and fibers that's much more sustainable. Um, this is Superman, S-U-P-A-M-A-N. And Superman's a hip hop artist, very positive, actually really, really good music to listen to. I would definitely check him out, perform sometimes in the Bay Area, comes down here and dresses the traditional regalia, but it's super positive, uplifting music. Um, this is right here. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read this book, but this is Tommy Orange. Tommy Orange is actually from Oakland, um, a local writer, right? wrote There There, which has been widely recognized in Native literature and is, um, is an incredible book. Uh, you can also, if you have the Libby app, you can download the Libby app and actually listen to the book, which is a cool way to, to experience it. Um, and it really is based in the Bay Area. So it kind of tells it a real contemporary perspective on Native uh, stuff for native community in this area. Like I felt like I knew all the characters in this book. Uh, if you haven't heard this man or met or seen this man around in the community, this is Dean Hoagland. is the chairman of the Coast Miwok Tribal Council in Marin County. Um, incredible educator, incredible resource, uh, cultural knowledge holder, very generous with sharing about his culture and traditional ways. Um, Dean is, is, is definitely uh, an incredible activist in this area. Um, this is Crystal Wapapa. So Crystal is a chef who um, is working with a lot of local foods that are um, being sustainably harvested. Um, things like elderberry, uh, acorns, uh, venison. And uh, she just opened a kitchen, actually a restaurant in Fruitvale BART station. And she also uh, has pop-ups from time to time at different locations. And you can actually go and try indigenous local foods over at this restaurant over in Oakland. Um, another like flag for shopping for Christmas is OXDX, uh, a native, a Diné um, uh, clothing maker fashion. Native fashion is huge. There is so many incredible native fashion designers from all over. And OXDX makes this t-shirt, which is very popular, Native Americans Discovered Columbus. It's a great t-shirt and there's a lot of awesome designs. And I would highly recommend looking at shopping from native artists or local artists anyways for, for Christmas, if you celebrate. Um, this is Sashin Little Feather. She's a very dear friend of mine. Um, she is, she lives locally. She's a, a famous native activist. She's very famous for declining the Oscar for Marlon Brando in 1971 or two when he won for The Godfather. So she was on stage. It's a famous video, you can YouTube it. Um, she goes on stage and makes a speech and declines the Oscar. Um, in honor of uh, the people who were making a stand at Wounded Knee at the time in an occupation, much like they had at Alcatraz. And then as well as um, also against the portrayal of native people in Hollywood, because Hollywood has been extremely damaging to native people and their identity. Um, it was only until recently that actually native people were actually playing native characters. Um, this is the community of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. They have a thriving casino. They're doing tons of really wonderful land work up in um, uh, um, Sonoma County. And they just signed a 20 year contract to work with the National Park Service out in Point Reyes. So they're, they're really pulling back traditional um, uh, activism in this area. And um, this is the Segura Land Trust, which Segorate Land Trust, which is based in Oakland, or based in Berkeley. And this is Karina Gould. And they are doing incredible rematriation of land, sustainable um, uh, farming and teaching traditional ways. And they also have been working with the city in terms of like taxation and benefits for the native tribe uh, through the city. This is Teresa Harlan, somebody we work with at the museum. Um, she's starting the Alliance for Felix Cove, which is a, a program to um, support 
um, the indigenous indigenization of, of Point Reyes and to keep uh, Point Reyes uh, accessible for Native people. Um, we also have the indigenous red market, which is something to look up. If it's happening, it's happening in Oakland and it's a market where you can go meet like Crystal Wapapa and you can go see Superman sometimes performs there. Um, and this is Vince Medina and their partner um, and they run the Ohlone Cafe. They did have a pop-up restaurant in Berkeley, but I think they're doing more um, like separate things, freelance things now. And lastly, the old, this, the, the history of native community in the Bay Area is huge. It's rich, it's very dense. This was an area of relocation in the 70s, 50s and 70s, I believe. Native people were promised a ticket to uh, a city so they could have a uh, re, you know, start their life, get a job, and they would have a place to live. And a lot of Indians were brought here to the Bay Area and there was nothing. There was no job, there was no home. They were kind of like, dropped off in the city and it was a forced assimilation. And one of the things that fostered out of that is that there was the first indigenous community center in the entire uh, US. And that was at the Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland, which is where this picture is. And that mural on the wall was a mural that I painted over a year um, with two other artists, Vanessa Yeva and Theo Knox. So the history in the Bay Area is rich of native people. Um, and there are all of these native people still doing things, activities. There's lots of things happening in the Bay Area. And I highly encourage you to uh, follow up and check out some of these things. So if you're interested to learn more, you can go to marinindian.com, which is where we have our website. There we're building our resource page. There is a, a links page where you can read a lot of great articles. You can sign up for a newsletter where we send a lot of information about current events. And then um, you can email me with any questions or anything that you ever need help with at director at marinindian.com. And I think that's about all I have to share with you guys. So if you have any questions, I am definitely open for that. I know I was talking fast, but I was trying to make sure I got all my information in there. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. It was super interesting and it's so interesting to learn about all the history and all of this, because I'm from Europe, so I don't like, didn't grow up here, right? So it's super interesting for me to hear about it. Because as you said, like for me, a lot we get to know over like Hollywood, like movies, right? And so I really appreciate this, like the true picture of it, I guess. Yeah. For sure. I want to say thank you um, because it was cool seeing um, how uh, everywhere, like uh, everywhere we're on indigenous land. So um, anywhere that you are, you can um, educate yourself and then educate others. And um, like you said, there's so many organizations um, that are dedicated to educating people. Um, so it was really cool to hear about it, um, especially College of Marine. Um, I, I feel like it's not part of um, this course in, a, um, in, in Marin County. So uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. Yeah, for sure. Well, one of the things I would say too about and learning, I think it's a really good point, you know, learning about what land you're on is that one of the things we're, we're all dealing with is climate change. And um, even though Native people shouldn't have to hold it all, we do hold a lot of the keys to really figuring out how to tackle climate change. So if you get to know where your, what your, who your Native community is, a lot of the answers for how to keep that land going sustainably can be from the Indigenous knowledge. For instance, we're now learning about controlled burning from the Native people that are from California. And that was the way of land management, tending the wild and taking care of it. So yeah, it's really good to learn where you're on. Thank you. Okay, if that's all, I think, um, thank you so much, Victoria. I really appreciate you coming. And I think everyone should go check out the museum. Um, are you guys open during COVID right now? Well, 
So we might be closing up through December. We might have a, a sale. We actually have a gift store. It's pretty, pretty cool, a gift store. And so we might have a sale and maybe a drum group come and have a little event. So if you keep an eye on our website, you'll be able to find out or sign up in the newsletter. Um, but a lot of times we will, like, I think after January, we'll probably be open regularly on the weekends. We're only open on the weekends and I would check in on us because we're staffing deficient. A lot of small organizations are really struggling with trying to deal with staffing. But if you send me an email, I'm there Tuesday through Friday. If you send me an email, you know, you can make arrangements to come by and I will show you about the museum. I, I will take the time. So i um, cause I want to be there for supporting everybody learning more about indigenous America. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It has been such a pleasure and I, I cannot speak for everyone, but I really enjoyed it and I'm taking away a lot from this um, presentation from this event. So yeah, I really appreciate that you took the time and you came here and you talked to, to us and yeah, thank you. For sure. Yeah. Reach out if you guys have any questions at all. All right. Will do. Thank you guys. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I never know if I should jump off or not. Am I good to go? Oh.